Hey Cam followers, welcome to another one of our Facebook Lives. Tonight we are joined by the ever so lovely Helen and Victoria from Morton Moral College who are going to talk to us all about obesity. So I'm going to pass over to you guys to give a little introduction about yourselves. Let you oh, go first. Thanks, Rosemary. Rosemary. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go first. <laughs> so uh, my name is Helen Coleman and I am a subject lead and a uh, lecturer at Morton Moral College for the animal behaviour and animal therapy degrees. Um, I started off in pet retail um, before I transitioned over to teaching and I've been at the college about 13 years and just really enjoy working with the next um, generation of, of animal practitioners and I'm really passionate about responsible pet ownership as well. Uh, hi I'm Victoria Bose so I'm the veterinary nursing course manager at our Morton Moral Centre um, and I have been working at the college over 15 years. Um, my passion is about veterinary nursing and what we can do as veterinary nurses to influence responsible pet ownership and support owners in different varying states and problems they may come across in the practice. Um, I have a specific specialism in emergency critical care um, and uh, a quite a big focus between myself and Helen on pet obesity, which is where our book came in when we published that last year. So we really do feel that obesity is a, an issue that is becoming more and more commonplace. And it's something we should be doing as, as animal practitioners to help the sort of consumers and the customers out there. Yeah, I'd read a really good paper that you guys had written about um, some bits and pieces we're going to talk tonight. And um, that's why I got in touch with you. And as you say, you've got this brilliant book that you've written. So we'll talk a bit more about that a bit later. Um, let's go straight into it then. So what do we mean by obesity? Why is it a bad thing um, in our doggies? Go on, <laughs> so obesity is um when we think about obesity it is very much becoming a, a commonplace and a lot of people don't see it being a problem they think oh my my animal's just a little bit overweight but that's okay it actually is is not okay um one of the focuses we'll talk about tonight is the impact it can have specifically on canine arthritis um, and osteoarthritis um Obesity is not healthy for the dog in the long term um, and it could cause problems with joints. Uh, we can get problems with the heart, problems with the lungs, multiple other problems that can be happening with these animals that may be becoming obese. Um, and also it's not it's not fair on the animal with this extra weight that they have to carry around. Um, so there's quite a, a heavy impact on obesity on the animal, specifically on the dog. Um, and their day-to-day -day movements and their sort of day-to-day -day general life and happiness and well-being. Mm, I think that's something that we sort of touched upon, wasn't it, in the fact mm -hmm. that it's, it's quality of life as well. And, and of course, an overweight dog, um, you know, can have reduced quality of life. And, you know, it's whether they're enjoying their exercise, whether they're enjoying their walks, uh, whether they're finding everyday activities more difficult because of the extra weight they're carrying around. And I think it's, you know, partly down to, you know, owner, owner perception and, and acceptance as well from us in terms of what we deem is typical for a breed. And, and I won't use the word normal um, because, you know, even with a Labrador, we know there can be so much variation with, with a typical Labrador, for example. So um, just attaching a label of a large breed or a medium breed isn't quite quite enough um, because it also depends on, you know, what role that dog plays. Is it a working dog or is it a pet dog? Uh, so again, that's something that we've really thought about and considered in terms of, again, the impact of, of obesity because, if you were to see a dog on the street or skin and bone, it would get sympathy from most people. I don't think there would be many people that could walk a dog past a dog like that and say that that was okay. Yeah. And yet we regularly, and, and I do when I'm walking my dog daily, see dogs that are, are overweight. And, and yet we seem to find that that's acceptable and that's okay. And, and not as a bigger welfare issue as let's say a, a really underweight uh, apparently starved dog so again it's down to to kind of what what we perceive as to be okay and acceptable um so that's something we've definitely thought about quite a lot 
We yeah, think we will see. Sorry, Esme. <laughs> no, I was going to say, I think you're absolutely right. You, um, so I've got a sausage dog, and uh, the number of times, I mean, at the moment, he's a little bit on the chubby side, and so I'm happy to admit that he's on a diet. But, but um, the number of times I've taken him out when he's at his prime, and people have said to me, oh, he looks very skinny. And I said, no, mm. this is what they should look like. Their belly shouldn't be dragging along the floor, and he should be able to run around with you. And we take ours, and he can go on and run with us, even though he's got okay. dinkle legs, he's still fit enough to be able to do that and run with 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 us um and you know i think it's the same with a lot of breeds we see them as when the typical dog is actually overweight so when your dog is fit you kind of think am i and am i starving him is he too skinny then actually yours is probably the one that's right and theirs are the ones that need addressing we see that quite regularly it's interesting because both Helen, Helen's dog Jasper and, um, and my dog Nero both are on the slightly leaner side and mm. so when the students do health checks at college a lot of them say they, they could be just verging on underweight so it's interesting to see when they consider that and then they actually realise no that is actually a very good weight score that we're looking at there, a very good body condition score on them both. Um, I've got a Cavalier, uh, King Charles Spaniel and notoriously because of their big beautiful bulgy eyes they just get fed all the time and they are very prone to becoming obese and um everybody who has met nero frequently over the years has said oh he's ever so underweight he, he actually isn't he's just a very fit and very healthy dog yeah. yeah it's so nice to see them as a vet when they come in and they are so fit and healthy you end up sort of over praising when they're in the practice saying oh my god it's <laughs> The Labrador who's skinny, that's amazing. It's perfect. Um, because yeah. do, and I think I, I think as a practitioner it can be quite hard as a vet to say to somebody, Well, oh, I'm really sorry, but I do think your dog needs to lose a few pounds, especially if their perception is their dog isn't overweight. It can be quite yeah. an, an awkward one to, to deal with. So yeah. I guess my next question to you guys is how does somebody know what weight their dog should be? Gosh, I mean, that is a good, is a really good question because again, we're using the word, what should it be? And again, um, it's, it's sort of taking into account factors such as age, its health status, the breed of the dog, for example. And we've referred to the body condition score, um, particularly the five point system. And I, I'm not sure whether generally people are aware of the body condition score system and and actually how to effectively use that because that again it's down to perception and there is there is an element i think of um uh, sort of um it's sort of individual opinions as to what is kind of okay and and some people might um you know feel along the ribs for example and um hopefully they can run their hands along and be able to feel the ribs without um having to prod too hard um but again so because, oh you only have to prod a little bit and you hear comments like that which we tend to brush off and it's oh it's to perhaps just have to prod a little bit harder and and then they're there and you think well well actually um without being too pedantic um that little bit easily creeps up to a little bit more and a little bit more and um it's, it's almost like the owner you know takes it personally um but it's also <laughs> taking into account like my dog is an absolute scavenger and I know he eats things out on walks regardless of how hard I try to keep him focused entertain I play like award games with him if he smells something he's a springer spaniel he's gone um, yesterday he snuffled a bit of cake out on the walk which is fantastic um, on the inside I am cringing uh, he's thinking brilliant this is the best day ever so I you know I'm always mindful that I do have to take into account what he snuffles um, which is what Vic said you know I, I tend to keep him on the lighter side because he, he does have quite an active life but he also comes to the college with me and he's really lucky and gets to see students and participate in lots of lectures so he gets quite a few treats so you know I have to try and factor that in as well so I think in terms of the body condition score um, having that nice little tucked in waist um, you know being able to feel the ribs easily but they shouldn't necessarily be protruding 
But of course, if you were to compare that to a whippet or a greyhound, um, you know, just slightly seeing the ribs would be typical for that breed. So again, it's just making sure that we've got that perception correct for the breed. Do you want to add anything in there, Vic? No, I think you've got it right there. I mean, there is, as we've said quite a few times, there's no such thing as the the standard size. Um, mm. But it is looking at the individual animal and, and using the body condition scores. They are, are some yeah. of the best ways rather than average weights. Um, but always, I always think we have to be uh, thoughtful as well when we make the decision to say an animal is overweight of uh, the considerations of the owner as well it may be that the animals put weight on due to possible chronic illnesses or something that's going on that may have caused the weight gain um so when we tackle the word obesity is a very tough topic to tackle and it is careful use of wording and and supportive mm -hmm. and empathetic support for your clients and and also for your friends as well, because, you know, at the end of the day, sometimes it's your friends that notice that they're overweight or they're underweight, etc. And they might just just mention a comment that makes you think and, and things like that. So mm -hmm. I, I do think there's not quite such a thing as the norm, but also we have to be sensitive around that word as well. Yeah. But also the biological issues, you know, an ageing dog, for example. Yeah. Um, when do you put that dog onto a lighter or, or a senior food, for example? So typically that would be around the age of seven. But of course, that's going to be sooner for, you know, a large or giant breed and could be that little bit later for a really small dog, um, like your sausage dog, for example. Um, so, again, it's taken that into account because if you take, you know, my Springer Spaniel, for example, age seven would be a typical age that he'd be classed a senior um but i didn't actually move him onto a senior food till he got to around eight just over eight years old because he was still really active um on his walks in terms of what he does with me on a daily activities coming to work for example but i noticed his weight was starting to creep on even though i hadn't really changed anything about his like feeding regime yeah but then when I really took notice and and really started to watch him out on walks, I realized that he wasn't quite as manic. Everyone knows a Springer Spaniel never goes in a straight line. They're all over the place. Um, and actually, he was closer to me than he usually was. Not that he ever went that far away from me, but he was a bit closer. And, and now at 10 years old, he, he is definitely more of a plodder than he was. So he's not expelling the energy that he that he used to. Yeah. So that was the right time when I, I noticed the weight creeping on. His chest got that little bit deeper. He started just to get a little bit more rounded, I won't lie. And um, his his waist wasn't quite as defined as it, as it is now. Like he's he's spot on now, and I want to try and keep him at that ideal weight um, for as long as possible, particularly going into his senior years. So, so I do think we do need to take into account age and and the health factors, health mm -hmm. status will come into that as well. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to take this moment to just signpost people really because body condition scoring is something we offer for free through Camp. So you can send Wonderful. those and we do free body condition scoring to help. I know most vet practices will do that. And most vets do that without you knowing. So nearly every single consult I do, I'll write down body condition yeah. score this, even if they came in yeah. for an ear infection. And yeah. um, we might not talk about it because we're talking about the ear because yeah. that's important at that moment. So most yeah. vets and vet nurses are very, very, very comfortable with, with uh, body condition scoring. And then once you've got your dog to that perfect three out of five, then weigh them and then you'll know where you're aiming in terms of kilos yeah. because it isn't easy to say I need him to lose 0.5 of a body condition score. That's not a, it's not a target, is it? So if you can say, well, he was perfect at 23 kilos and he's 23.7, right, let's try and get him back to 23 again because he was so good at that point. Yeah. Um, yeah. It yeah. makes it easier. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. With them, yeah. when you're looking at weight clinics and you are looking at significant weight loss programs maybe that you're putting in place it it does genuinely have to be slow because you will have to have quite a significant consideration about say for example you've got an obese pet a lot in most people's heads the first thing they'll think oh i know i'll increase his exercise i'll increase i'll take him for a run that, that's going to be perfect they'll fix it in in some way that will actually make it worse the obesity impact on um arthritis osteoarthritis is quite significant 
Um, as as the weight goes on, you're getting more wear and tear on the joint. Um, it's quite there's quite a lot of research around um, people or animals that start arthritis management. One of the biggest parts we need to address is the weight. So as you start to reduce the weight, you will start to see a significant loss of the impact um, on the arthritis clinical signs, maybe some reduction in lameness, but you will see it gradually. It won't be, it will fix overnight. But when you have got an animal with a, a significant level of obesity, we can't just suddenly go, right, okay, let's 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 do this, that and the, the other. It's a very, very slow process and, and needs to be worked with a practitioner to create a very slow manageable um sort of dietary plan if that makes sense yeah and you touched on there the uh, the impact that obesity has on um arthritis because we know that there's pro-inflammatory factors in the actual fat so it's not just the mechanical yeah. load that they're getting on those joints but it's the inflammation that's actually going on is exacerbated yeah. by by the fat being present in the body so you're absolutely right you don't want to crash diet them because all they're going to do is pile that straight back on again and it's not going to benefit long term from from that improvement yeah, yeah. it is it is looking and it it's not just changing i uh, you know like a fad diet for example i'm going to do or lose all this weight then i'll start eating again and then the body's mind if you just suddenly lose so much weight so quickly it's mm. like oh quick save all those calories and it will just become fat again with all your nice pro-inflammatories back in there again so yeah. there is a lot of uh discussion around slower slower weight loss mm. programs combined with multimodal support systems around your osteoarthritis mm. your physiotherapists your hydrotherapists acupuncture and all the bits that we can include to sort of contribute and to uh, work together to make a nice com complex and sort of cohesive mm. plan of osteoarthritis management mm. and weight yeah. management. I, I think it's also important for owners to realise that um, you know they're not going to get judged you know it is okay to go in and discuss this with the vets because I think there is that element of oh my goodness you know I'm, I'm you know I'm, I'm the terrible owner for example um because I've allowed my dog to get big and the vets told me off and you hear that a lot the vets told me off and actually the vet won't have, have told the owner off but you know that it's trying to be sensitive towards the issue that they might have introduced to to the owner to go you know perhaps go away and have a little think and and it isn't a personal attack because it could be a biological issue um it could be that that owner lives with somebody for example who has dementia um you know perhaps that dog is getting three or four meals a day where it didn't normally um used to get provided with that amount of food and that is that is absolutely nobody's fault whatsoever but of course there are things that 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 owner can do you know to work with the vets and the vet nurses to try try and help that situation um you know nobody wants to accuse or judge so i think it's um you know really important to create that environment with the owners that they can discuss these issues if they do have have some concerns because it can be quite difficult to one admit okay my dog is is getting a little bit overweight um maybe it's accepting that that dog is getting older which can be really hard as well um and, and maybe a recent diagnosis of arthritis could also be really worrying for an owner so you know we want to treat our, our pets and Vic and I have talked before about you know killing with kindness you know we, we love our pets and we want to treat them and they are very good at reading us and giving us those doe eyes and many of us fall for it um so again it's just kind of getting those boundaries um boundaries right uh in terms of when we treat how we how we treat in terms of the feeding methods the feeding regime for example so it is okay to go to the vet if you're worried i think yeah i think that's, you're so right there and i think um a lot of the times these things are said because we're in a rush so we might say mm -hmm. well right he does need to while we're here you need to lose some weight yeah. and then that's the end of it and you can take that quite yeah. defensively if it's come across yeah. a bit drunk. um so trying not to not to take it too personally and that hopefully the is from a, a good point of view sometimes it's just that there's no time so they're not given no. not put it in the right. most sensitive way but it isn't nice no. i get defensive when i know my dogs are overweight and i know they are 
I just don't want someone to tell me that because I'm already yeah. working on it. Um, but, you know, <laughs> even as yeah. that myself, okay, my dogs aren't fat, but they are, I would say, on the bit too big on the scale. Um, so, and it happens, it happens, life happens. They've been yeah. fed too many yeah. treats, for whatever the case, it might be walked less for whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we're all, you know, nobody's dog is going to be perfect weight all the time. I, no. I think that's absolutely not. People. No, or you know, if you've got little children in the house who happen just to leave food and drop food, you know, the dogs yeah. soon catch on. <laughs> so you know, it could be that something in the environment has changed. That you know, you know, we're so busy and have got so many things to think about that, that it might just not have twinked, and it might just take for someone to say, "Oh, you know, what's changed?" To for you then to go away and think, actually, yeah, actually, you know, there. You know, I am working more. I haven't perhaps paid as much attention. I haven't quite weighed out my dog's food as, as rigidly as I as I used to. And you know, these factors. That, you know, I say life happens, and there is no judgment. And there's plenty mm. of help and support out there if you're not quite sure how to tackle the issue. I think also it's important to know that if your dog is overweight and you're trying to get them to lose weight and they're not losing weight, that maybe mm. that's the point where we need to think, oh, okay, something might be going on. They could have a thyroid yeah. issue, or yeah. an endocrine problem, yeah. or you know, might need more yeah. investigations. So yeah. could absolutely be a problem. One of the key yeah. things when you are considering possibly starting a weight management plan it is to work in collaboration with a, a multimodal team, your vet your vet nurses, you your su holistic support therapies, so your hydros, mm -hmm. your your acupuncture, your uh, maybe some massage, and then also into your physio. So it's not just one person mm. gets involved because there's so many things and as you say if you are doing a weight management program and you you've been going on it for a few weeks and your animal has not even lost a, a small amount of weight you possibly will need to go back to the veterinary surgeon and book an appointment and go for further investigation at that point mm. or if the animal has suddenly just put on uh, a significant amount of weight for no real apparent reason, again, you're going to be needing to go to mm -hmm. a veterinary surgeon to get some actual investigations as to what's going on there. Yeah, definitely. And it's not just about cutting food down either, because the dog will starve. Um, mm -hmm. It might mean that you need just some nutritional advice um, to maybe change the, the particular food that that dog is on. Because um, I have heard stories, people before going, I keep cutting the food down, and I keep cutting the food down. And you think, crikey, that dog must be absolutely starving. Um, so there's so many factors. Yeah, and then the body goes into sort of a storing mode instead of a mm. instead of a using mode, don't they? Mm. And we've got yeah. a few comments. I just think I'll quickly read out if that's okay. okay. Um, Robin's just set, uh, stated that. Uh, studies show that people aren't good at picking out their, bod their dog's body condition score. She sees sort of 70 to 80 percent of patients um, being overweight um, mm -hmm. and they don't seem to understand the health implications mm -hmm. that it might involve. Tara yeah. says she watches her Doberman's weight like a hawk and they do weekly weigh-ins. Um, she cuts back if he goes up and um, she goes into con she takes into consideration his exercise especially in the summer and the winter and that's mm -hmm. why he's still competing at nine years old. Um, wow, Tara, that's very good. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Cool. And then both Robin and Leslie, they talk about the one to nine body condition score system. So there's two, um, yeah, sort of two ways. I prefer the one to five because that's just what I've always used. Or you can yeah. use one to nine. It is basically the same thing because the one to five includes halves. So yeah. it, it's the same thing. Yeah. It just comes yeah. as long as you're putting. Yeah. When we're doing it, we're keeping it consistent. So you're stating. Mm. So for me, three out of five is perfect. When you're looking at the one to nine, you're looking at four and a half to five out of nine is your perfect time. Yeah. And we just kept to the one to five really for simplicity for our for our book, um, because actually, like I say, you know, one to five, three, bang in the middle. People generally kind of understand that. And it's really easy concept to, to sort of take on board. So just for simplicity. But you can use one to nine. Depends how specific, I guess, you, you want to be. Yeah. So the next thing I'm going to ask you about is this illusion called the double <laughs> illusion. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. <laughs> Go on Vic. Okay. Start us off. Yeah, I'll start us off. 
so um this illusion actually comes from a human based illusion which is very interesting and uh you know i have fallen prey to this over the years i'm not going to lie i buy a nice big new food bowl and i'm like oh look at this food bowl i have a small cavalier i put his food in the bowl and i think oh that looks like what i would feed a very small mouse in that big bowl um maybe i'll just top it up a little bit more because he looks starving so i'm just going to put a bit more in there and and this is where the del Booth effect comes in it's um it's it's used a lot in humans and and human weight control as well um i don't know if you've ever been on a diet yourself and you've gone down the right i'm i'm gonna reduce my food portions so if we reduced our food portions and we had them on a big plate it would look like a big plate with a very small food portion However, if we reduced the plate and the food portion, it would still look like a nice sized food portion on a smaller plate. So it's actually doesn't impact the dogs because you could guarantee if we gave the dog the option of a large plate or a small plate, they would definitely go large plate. Um, but if you went for an owner um, that maybe hadn't selected a food bowl that was suitable for the breed, so like Nero, who has his significantly large food bowl, um, and then poured a bit of food in and thought, oh, that's quite small. So topped it up again and a few more and a few more. And that in itself lends to obesity. Um, and I'm not sure if you want to talk about the scoops, Helen, but the scoops has a bit of a role in that as well. Um, but definitely with the food bowls, it's called the Del Booth illusion because it's about making the bowl size fit the portion size. Mm. So that's where the bowl is around. So if you're an owner, don't have a, a quite large food bowl for a small dog because in your head, it's quite a small portion. Mm. That's the sort of food bowl and the Del Booth illusion. But Helen, there's some scoop in there. Do you want me to talk about the scoop? Do you have? There's some scoop. scoop as well. Yeah, absolutely. And it's all about it's all about uh, rele size relevance, really. So Victoria's talked about the the bowl itself, but also um, in terms of the studies that have been done, there's also um, a thought process behind the the utensil or whatever equipment it is you use to transfer the food into the bowl. So some people might use a cup or a scoop or you know something that maybe have been provided with the food brand itself either or so again if you were for example to present um an, an owner this is from an owner's perspective mm -hmm. and you ask them to weigh out a standard portion of, of you know a particular ration for a dog and you gave them for example a small scoop and a small bowl and a small scoop and a large bowl or a large scoop and a small bowl mm -hmm. or a large scoop and a large bowl any thoughts as to which one might be more accurate? Unless you've done your research. You should ask this to the <laughs> to the yeah. audience, really. Yeah. Um, but in the interest, in any comments? Because some of your no uh, one's I'm, I'm audience guessing, might know. No, I, yeah, I'm I'm fascinated. I've got no idea. This like <laughs> I'm trying so, to work out what I prefer to do. <laughs> I think it's probably a really small, hard. small bowl. That would be my best for me. But then I have small breed dogs, so that makes the most sense to me. Ah, uh, so you might have some. You might have a bowl and utensils that are appropriate to the size of your dog. Yeah. Um, so, for example, um, for for my dog Jasper, he's a medium breed dog. Um, I I use a, a tall bowl, so I use a pet waiter for him. So it's a slightly raised bowl, but actually it's quite a big bowl, far too big for what he needs. And actually, when I put his um, daily ration in there, it looks like nothing, and there's still plenty of room on the bottom of the bowl. And if I, you know, was to perhaps go with with my head and my gut and go, oh my goodness, excuse the pun, I might sort of go, oh gosh, that's nowhere near enough, I'll just put a bit more in, then I'm going to be completely overloading my dog. So actually, small scoop, small bowl actually had the most accurate records. Mm -hmm. So as Victoria said, there might be, you know, you might have, uh, you know, a, a 
Rottweiler, for example, or a German Shepherd dog, and you think, right, I'm going to get a great big ceramic bowl where it's really heavy, and I'm going to fill it. Um, and of course, that then is completely skewing um, the portion size that that dog actually needs and requires. So um, I also am a little bit rigid with um, what, how much I feed my dog per day, and I, it gets weighed out every single day. Um, but actually, as a little time saver for me, you know, when I'm busy to from work, etc., um, I've actually got five little pots. Every and no, I've got, got seven. Uh, every week, I weigh out his 200 grams. So I've literally got seven pots sat there, and every time they run out, I top them all up. So every day, I go into the cupboard, grab a pot. That is what he has per day. So I do use the feeding guidelines on the packet as a guideline. So that's the key word, um, because there's always a range that they give you. And I always keep him on the lower end. He's not the biggest Springer Spaniel. He's not particularly small. He is around the middle. He is quite active for a 10 year old, but he is slowing down. So I have to take all of those factors into account and I actually keep I feed him on the lower end of what's recommended um, because I know he gets some treats and, you know, and why not? Um, you know, I have to factor in. You know, he doesn't get a lot by all means, but he does get a few through the day. But I also am in control of, of what he gets through the day on, on the large part of it. So, yes, I too weigh out religiously his food for every single day day um but yeah you're, you're right uh, the most variability ironically was the large scoop large bowl because it's hard to judge um when you're just scooping out um so it's it's all about perception and and what the individual human so there's an awful lot of um subjectiveness there as mm. to what that dog should or shouldn't be getting on a daily basis yeah and on a very, um, I guess, monetary basis, the the less you're feeding, so obviously you want to feed enough, but mm -hmm. if you're not overfeeding your dog, the food's going to last longer and your bag's going to go further. So money-wise, it's also a lot better for your pocket yeah. to be yeah. Yeah. feeding the correct amount, especially when you have got those large breed dogs, because some of the, I mean, yeah. I can't imagine it because my dogs are so yeah. tiny, they would yeah. laugh at me about they eat I a know, day. a bag, a bag yeah. lasts I forever, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 So, you know, I go through a two kilo bag in a month, you know, mm. it's, it takes forever to feed my dogs. Whereas if you fed that to a, a massive Rottweiler, that would be what a couple of days worth of food. So, you know, I can imagine yeah. when you've got a large breed dog that it does make a big difference. Yeah. If you're feeding 50% more, mm. although quantity mm. is probably easier to feed a small dog 50% more because you don't yeah. realise that they need such yeah. a tiny amount. Yeah, so, it's so, so easy to feed, just that little yeah. bit more, because you think, oh, it's just a little bit, but to a little dog, that is a huge difference. So ways to help the dog uh, make their food last longer. So uh, we've talked about plain old bowls, but what yeah. other ways would you suggest in, that we can feed dogs that might make food time more interesting? You do quite a few of these, don't you, Helen? So Oh, yeah, we're a fan, yeah. We're a fan of food enrichment. Um, <laughs> Because I, I, I have, if you didn't know already, I have a Springer Spaniel. Uh, and in all honesty, I know Labradors get a bad rap for being greedy, but I honestly <laughs> think Springer Spaniels are not far from them on that list, especially mine. He's very, very food orientated um, and his food is gone pretty quickly, especially when he's around other dogs. Um, he's an only dog at home, but if he's around other dogs, my goodness, it's vacuumed within seconds. So uh, at home, I have a variety of, of food enrichment, um, one of them being the snuffle mat. That's that's the favourite go-to uh, for, for him and me. He absolutely adores it. You might know it as a, um, a foraging mat. It's got various, various names um but uh he he loves that and he will spend uh easily five minutes um just checking he's got every last crumb um and he'll even leave it and he'll go back maybe once maybe twice just in case so mentally that's really uh, providing a lot of stimulation uh, it's encouraging the sniffing behavior which is also very calming um it's tapping into his sort of natural uh, instincts as well but it's making him take a lot longer over his food so um when you think about um you know that's a really big part of that dog's day you know walk feed 
that you know that's probably the most exciting things in their day and it's over in seconds so if we can sort of extend that time out make it more enjoyable then that's going to absolutely be be more beneficial for the dog um what else do i use egg cart egg boxes, egg boxes brilliant yeah. uh he loves an egg box because i can rattle it and i can make it sound really really fun um he might destroy the egg box in the meantime well what, what's so what? It's not, not doing him any harm, um, providing obviously he's not going to go sit and eat it and ingest it, which I know he doesn't do. So I always make sure that I'm around while I give him these things, of course. Um, he loves an egg box. So during the day, in the middle of the day, um, particularly during lockdown, um, I, I wanted to try and make that last. And I wanted to try and um, give him something, an activity during the middle of the day. So I just get a little bit out of his pot of food for the day. I put it into the egg box, put it in the garden, and he would just knock it around and, and uh, you know, get the food out. And he loves that. And he knows now, egg box, I rattle it, he knows what that is. So it doesn't take him very long because he's worked that one out. But it's quite a nice, fun activity um, for him. Yeah. Um, gosh, there's loads of it. Can you think of any more? Yeah, they're, well, they're my um, two yeah, your, your two faves. I have a treat ball, <laughs> Nero. He, um, yeah. To be honest, he, he uh, I'm not quite sure he would just sit on a shuffle mat or not even partake in the activity, to be honest. So, um, and he just stared at the egg box during lockdown and didn't do anything with it. So that was just a failure. Um, so uh, he actually does prefer a treat ball. So I pop usually some of his measurement from his food from the day just into his treat ball and he will chase it around the floor so not only is he chasing his food around he's got a bit of exercise going in there and he's yeah. getting a reward for it at the same time um so he really finds that um perfect the the other thing you could look at doing is making a game out of the food so maybe training them giving them some form of training um some people i know i've got friends that scatter feed so they take the food and then scatter it possibly in the patio or, or on a certain area wherever they prefer to put it I'm not a fan of that because sometimes you've got to think of maybe some of the vermin that might come around but if you can control the area and chuck some of the scatter food somewhere safe then that's perfect I, I think my friend does it on her garage floor so it works perfectly so she scatters it it's a big Labrador that as you say Dyson's around like this and then um so they do scatter it around and he does spend a bit longer doing that um gulp bowl gulp anti-gulp bowls are another one aren't they and maize feeders so we i'm yeah. i still find this as an example of my very clever cavalier that was with us bernard so we tried these maize feeders because he started to gulp his food mm. so we popped the maize feeder on but he figured out that if he slapped the side of the maize feeder it tipped over and then he could eat all his food in one go <laughs> so for him that didn't work out very well but they do work perfectly if you don't have a dog that figures out tapping the side tips them so you've got maize uh, sort of maize yeah. feeders as well yeah my dog hiccup the sausage dog is um a gannet he's awful yeah hiccup um and uh, <laughs> we've got a slow feeder one of the Kong yeah. ones where the the food as he yeah. tips it goes around the edge so yeah. he has to sit and he plays it which is good because my other dog eats the slowest he could possibly eat um and he's just he just does um so I have to do that so that I keep Hiccup busy while Stitch can finish his dinner, but also it means that Hiccup's dinner doesn't take one second. It takes him two yeah. or three minutes to eat. Um, yeah. I think you both touched on this, yeah. that you you'd suggest taking getting a portion, so weighing out the daily allowance and then feeding mm -hmm. it through these enrichment activities through the day. Because something yeah. we talk about with Cam is um, that we don't necessarily have to have one food time a day or two food times a day yeah. when an arthritic dog particularly ones who are very arthritic and not able to go out and about as much anymore um actually those are the biggest endorphin rushes they get in the day yeah. they don't get to go on their sniffaris yeah. anymore so if we can give them lots of little <laughs> in lots of fun ways yeah. it can be a really, really nice way to yeah. do enrichment with them that they can still join in with the game and, yeah. Yeah. and most dogs even with arthritis could tear up a uh, an egg box as you said yeah. or you know, hide it in a bag and they can maybe go and snuff yeah. around in there and find it as long as it's safe yeah. definitely yeah, yeah. sorry helen 
Okay. Now, as I said, the muffin tin um, game is is really fun as well. If you want to give your dog sort of a slightly more of a challenge, so if you've literally got a you know a muffin tin tray, uh, put some food in the bottom, get some tennis balls or slightly lighter ones, I say, depending on the dog's uh, you know ability and size. Um, you could put the balls on so of course they then have to you know knock the balls off and, and try and sort of get the food underneath and that can really take quite a long time depending on how challenging you do make it because a tennis ball is quite heavy but if you were to use the light sort of plastic balls then of course that's a lot easier so you can kind of alter uh, the complexity of that game as well depending on the dog so just again there's loads of ideas out there um on, on sort of facebook or if you go on the internet um there's loads of different ideas but yeah. definitely if you've got an older maybe an older dog with a little bit of arthritis um uh, my mum's dog uh is uh, another cavalier um <laughs> i have lots of cavaliers and uh he he they've got a slippy floor now this is where we can have a lot of a problem with the toys and the slippy floors so what we do do is we put a mat down and if he plays with the ball the treat ball he stands on the on the the mat and does the treat ball but it, you wouldn't you can notice a quite a significant difference if you do it on the um the oak floor away from the mat because he's obviously not sure he's uncomfortable with his arthritis and he's just a bit of unstable so if you are going down any of the sort of games it's just making sure they've got that level footing and the nice grips underneath the feet so they're not slipping and sliding and yeah. do a bit more tweaking on the arthritis yeah that's a really really good point i've seen some great things over in lockdown i saw people playing whack-a-mole you know with the oh, yeah. box holding with a yeah. carrot and the dog throwing a snap yeah. and grab it things like that people yeah. are so inventive and you can do yeah. it for you know, an old cardboard yeah. box and a carrot yeah. cost you nothing. Um, no, it, even I played the noughts and crosses game with my dog. That was great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's that's um, so we kind of talked about different things, but what would you say, um, what's the best way to manage weight loss in an arthritic dog? Because that's quite a tricky one, isn't it? When we've got mm. a dog who maybe isn't as mobile, um, yeah. but does need to lose a few pounds. Yeah, so this is this is definitely where you will need to be. I keep using the term multimodal, but I, when I say multimodal, it's multidisciplinary. You are p picking up different team members. So you may have a veterinary surgeon, a veterinary nurse, a physiotherapist, possibly a hydrotherapist, a nutritionalist. Um, these all may be involved specifically because it's a little bit more complex than just saying, well, you need to lose some weight. So let's get you on a weight management program where we're getting you running every day. It, it doesn't work like that. It very much is very slow, gradual increases. It may be the dog can't actually walk for some time until some of the weight is lost. So you may have to do a dietary change first and then increase an exercise over a time period so you may focus dietary and then increase with exercise it very very is very much dependent on uh, the level of obesity of the animal and how much exercise it can currently cope with um, and just gradually putting any changes in there um, hydrotherapy is one of the best sort of treatments we can also include um, if your dog's obviously not scared of water and and can cope with the water and there's no other pre-existing conditions this is looking at your non-weight bearing so you can it's very good for weight loss but only that it's it's reducing that load on the joints which is really important for especially with your arthritic dogs as well um a lot of people like to free run and unfortunately with an, a dog with osteoarthritis isn't really recommended sometimes with the free run or even the free ball throwing because a lot of us would whoosh, off goes the ball off goes the dog and don't think of the ooh, the jerks that they're getting when they grab the ball and they run back to us um they can all be quite quite poor and quite bad and not only that if the animal's already obese you suddenly start throwing a ball you've got an excessive pressure on the heart possibly pressure on the lungs and lots of other things going on so um it's it is about working as a team but also doing it very very gradually and very slowly yeah i don't know if you've got anything to add there helen i'm just 
I think um, the point you touched upon as well about is about free running. Um, you know, there's nothing the dog loves and, and perhaps we love more than getting to the field, you know, and doing that lead and letting them go. And sometimes um, that, you know, the dog's brain is is willing it to go and he wants to go and have a little run, for example. But the, the body perhaps doesn't appreciate that quite so much. Mm. And uh, I know it'd be really hard for me when I when I get to that stage with with my dog because uh, it's very rarely on the lead. Um, but there will be a time where you know if he's particularly sore, if he's had a really busy day, or you know has had a lot of exercise the day before, then I, I will slow um, the pace of the walk. I will alter my walk as well. I won't do the same walk necessarily. Um, I might avoid the fields because of that need and want to to go off and run. Um, so I, I will consider where I walk him and, and sort of how I go about that as well. So um, I think the point of free running is, is really important. And we don't want to restrict the dogs. We don't want to take their fun away from them. Absolutely not. Um, but it's just about balance. Um, and if they're having a good day, that doesn't mean that they're, you know, suddenly three years old again. It just means uh, they're having a good day. So what we don't want to go and do is completely overdo it. And then they're having a terrible two or three days afterwards because they're now regretting, um, you know, charging around the field or or playing with other dogs. Um, because you could be, you know, just leisurely walking along with your dog and your dog's having a lovely time it's, and do really good control. Around the corner comes a, a puppy, wants to play, and all of a sudden your dog thinks, yes, this is great. Mm -hmm. And like you say, they jump, they play, they twist. And, of course, they're, they're all the things that, um, well, the dog probably won't regret later, but but you as the owner are more likely to, to regret when you see the dog all stiff and, and uh, struggling to move the next day. Yeah, it's, it's sad, isn't it? Because there's a lot of the things yeah. we do, like the ball throwers, they're designed for fun for the dog, but actually yeah. all they do is cause repetitive strain yeah. and actually pre they actually cause arthritis in the long run. So yeah. There's a lot of things we can do to try and monitor mm -hmm. and moderate behaviour. Um, yeah. It's yeah. still fun, but maybe not to the same extent. Yeah. And there are lots of things you can do rolling games of, or hide and seek games of balls instead of yeah, I was just about to say sensory games are the, yeah. the sort of thing you yeah. know avoiding things sensory uh sensory walks as yeah. well taking them where walks maybe they've never been before so there's lots of sense it might only be a 20 minute walk or a 10 minute 15 minute walk a very small little plod because that's the speed they want to go at but then get lots of smells that's that's what makes their day yeah. you know one smell is everything yeah. to them so yeah, um, yeah. You, don't, you don't have to walk them for a whole hour either sorry has mm. so you don't have to go walk them for a whole hour because a, a new walk might be stimulating enough um to actually maybe re reduce that to maybe 30 minutes instead of an hour because actually that the mental stimulation that dog has got is actually tiring in itself rather than having to run um for, for a very long time yeah, and you're just letting your dog actually smell those smells. So we should be walking at our dog's pace, not the dog walking at yeah. our pace. I think that's yeah. one of the really important yeah. things, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. There was a lot in the, in lockdown, and you saw because the the focus was on, and I, I'm seeing it now on um, people and the obese, the NHS obesity program that is being advertised everywhere. So I have seen a, a significant increase in owners running with dogs, and you do see the occasional mm -hmm. older dog being slightly dragged along behind which obviously is not it's not fair on the dog and yes I suppose they're thinking the obesity management program let's get it running it's that whole thought of yeah. if we're obese possibly it's the first thing we would do is get running but we really need to focus on very slow gradual increases specifically on animals that are obese because just suddenly changing exercise isn't isn't really the answer it is gradual with a dietary management program yeah yeah so i suppose it could be it. oh sorry <laughs> done it again <laughs> it's a slight delay so i apologize um i was thinking as well it, it might be a case of that you might historically have been used to taking your dog for one long walk a day and it might be worth considering um what your routine is and whether you are able to adjust your own routine just to allow perhaps two shorter walks per day which your dog will much more um appreciate um because they still want to go out um 
and, and even the you know the, the most oldest doddery dog full of arthritis will still love to go out to have a little sniff but actually just allowing them a couple of times a day on a much shorter walk will still give them you know lots of pleasure and they'll still get a lot of benefit from that as well but again that is something to discuss with the owner because they may find that difficult to adjust their routine um, they may be unwilling um, to adjust their routine and in which case perhaps a dog walker could be employed um, perhaps for one of those walks a day or a couple of times a week just for a short walk just to help you out if you've got a really you know crazy busy lifestyle which is very typical these days yeah definitely so ladies we've mentioned your book a few times but I wondered if you could just tell us about your book <laughs> Helen's very good at this. I'll let Helen go with that one. Oh, okay. Put it in front of her as well. <laughs> oh, well, it just so happens. <laughs> just in case any questions came up. Um, yeah, Vic and I, um, a year ago, really fortunate enough to have a, a book published called The Man Management of Pet Obesity. I nearly wasn't able to say it. Da, 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 da. Here we go. So um, we have basically written this book um, for for the layman really it's for everybody um we you know we like to work from the point of view that we like to um, relate to to everybody so if you're a pet owner and you are worried about perhaps your dog aging and becoming obese or obesity is something of a concern to you um there's loads of sort of hints and tips, some of what we've talked about tonight in here. Um, there's a, bit, a lot about nutrition and, you know, choosing the right type of food for, for you. Um, you know, the, the lifestyle, the dog, the breed, you, you know, your pocket, um, for example. Um, so it can be really helpful. It could be, you know, as, as a student who is starting, you know, a course in veterinary nursing, animal management, for example, you know, animal behaviour, veterinary physiotherapy. Um, actually, again, uh, this is a relevant topic to anyone working with animals and it doesn't just cover dogs. Um, it does does cover you know cats and a range of companion animals as well as reptiles and birds so um yeah we like to appeal to to everybody so you know yes it is a bit of a plug but actually it can be a really useful tool for you um and it's something that you could perhaps use as a starting point with your vet um it could be that you know you've read a chapter in here about choosing the right type of food for example and it's something you could take to your vet and say look i've read this this is what I'm thinking. What do you think? Because, again, if you're going to be changing diets, then, you know, it is a good idea to get veterinary advice. Vic, do you want to add anything I haven't yeah, covered? No, um, <laughs> just just obviously our combined experience over the years with me and veterinary nurse and Helen in the animal industry. We came from two different viewpoints, which was really mm. nice to be able to put it within the book complementing each other hopefully throughout um, the time that we spent together as colleagues as well <laughs> so bringing our combined um, experiences was really important especially with both of us having experience over the years with managing obesity and speaking to clients and owners about obesity in different environments and you know one of our biggest focuses and I, I know we both feel this is that not everybody can afford the most expensive food that is on available and there is always an option that is lower calorie and relevant to meeting the needs of a diet pr program but not at the highest expense and that's one of the things that we've always felt together is that mm. we can always we can always find a diet that does fit and also fits your pocket at the same time yeah, absolutely. And it's so hard to choose the right diet. You can walk into into the pet shop, you can look online and it's just a minefield. It's what do you choose? What is right? Um, so, again, there's loads of, of hints and tips in there about, you know, reading pet food labels and making the right choice for, for you and your dog um, from a non bias perspective. And that's something that, you know, we're really, we feel quite passionate about as well. It's brilliant. And it's so great to Thank have you. that as a resource. It's really, really good. Um, okay. I'm just also going to do some plugging very quickly, um, just so that everybody knows. At the moment, our cam shop, we've got the full range of licky mats now. We've got the fish-shaped licky mat. We've got slow feeder bowls, and we've got <gasps> snuffy mats. So we've got loads of enrichment stuff. And on the cam shop. Um, so if you are, you've listened to this and you've been inspired to maybe feed your dog in a different way or try something out, then have a look on the cam shop. I'll put links to both the book and to the cam shop when we finish. Lovely. Um, so you can go and have a look. And, uh, 
I forgot yeah, about the licky mat. Yeah, I was gonna say <laughs> quick one yeah. with the licky mats. I, I was meant to mention that. If you feed tin food, the licky mats are the best thing for uh, a bit of enrichment, isn't it? You spread it out if you like the spreading out and the mess that might come from it, but you can <laughs> spread them out. They're really good as well for like a behavioral stimulus as well. So we, um, I smear mm. cheese on mine. I think it's uh, the one in Primula cheese on mine and Nero has that when I go out places. So it is very good. The licky mats are really good for that. Yeah. Keep them busy for five minutes, won't it? Yeah. Yeah, no, ladies, thank you so, so very much. I thoroughly this. enjoyed the thank evening. You. Um, hopefully it's been really useful to everybody listening. Um, we will share this again. So if you're watching back in a, in a few weeks and, um, you know, post date of this, please feel free to still ask questions and make mm -hmm. comments because we will see them on the Facebook page um, and, and get in touch if you've got any worries about your dog. Um, and, yeah, Helen and Victoria, Thank you extremely. So, oh, so, so, so. Thank, thank, <laughs> yeah. thank you for having us. It's been well, lovely yeah. to talk to you. And uh, we hope we'll have you on again to sort of talk about something else soon. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Anytime. We're always really happy to help. Yeah. We both okay. love you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thanks. See ya.